that just kind of rubbed Can I say? Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Rosa Parks did not have a bonnet on, Chad, but they still told her, get your ass to the back of the bus, okay? Our culture is activism, civil rights, the struggle. That is our culture. Hip-hop marked a tremendous shift from saying we're not going to cross over to the dominant culture. The dominant culture is going to cross over to us. There are constant pressures of assimilation. They want us to become homogenized without giving us the opportunity or even recognizing that there is a difference between our experiences here. And my question is how social engineers have created the notion that counterproductive qualities are to be celebrated and perpetuated as inextricable components of black culture. We're going to dress the way we dress, speak the way we speak. We're not going to be respectable. We're going to use words that are reprehensible <laughs> in otherwise civil company. And guess what? You must cross over to us, speak our vocabulary, speak our language, learn our grammar, learn our ways of being. There is no way for me to be the perfect American male because part of being the perfect American male is being white. Be black woman alone. If you don't think that something appears right, you don't have to look that way. I reserve the right for a black woman to look however the f they want to look when they leave the house. And that don't give you a right to say something. You're not going to say nothing or do nothing. Period. Naturally, those who adhere to this version of black culture, embracing it as their identity, fall further behind those who belong to cultures that practice conventional means of production, success, and progress. The gaps that naturally develop as a result of these cultural differences are viewed by social ideologues as disparities and inequities and are laid at the feet of the so-called system. There's only two explanations for racial inequality, for racial disparities. Either there's something wrong or inferior about black people, racist idea, or racial discrimination. Those are the only two explanations for any racial inequities. Activists insinuate the system is broken and racist for not rewarding those who embrace counterproductive cultures with such essentials as food, housing, jobs, all things which are traditionally obtained in correlation with the extent of one's ability and willingness to earn. There's only two explanations as to why white people in this country have roughly 15 times more wealth than black people. Either it's the case that black workers are lazy Black workers are unqualified, enjoy living on welfare. There's something wrong and inferior about black workers or job discrimination. You say there are no jobs, are people looking for jobs? What's the use of looking? Hey, where you going? No, we're not, we not hiring, we're not hiring. So what do you do all day? Sit around and do what I gotta do. The way you gotta live, you gotta do what you gotta do. They need training centers, really. They need to be trained, because a lot of people don't go to school anymore. I don't know. We need something to help us. I, that's all I know. We need help. That's all. But they can't help. Y'all can't help us unless they help themselves, really. You know, and they don't look like they want to put any effort into that. You know. Well, tell me about you. Do you work? No, I don't work. I'm on welfare. You always want to be connected with a group and making sure that you're continuing to to be to have that touchstone of this is. You know, this is where you came from, and this is how the folk, this is how the people talk, where you come from. What's cracking me? What's up? What's up, me? For shizzle hey. me. For shizzle me, yeah. Activists ascribe such character traits of broken, unintelligible speech, childish or frivolous attitudes and reasoning, and backwards values to black culture or blackness. Yet, in his book, Black Rednecks and White Liberals, Dr. Thomas Sowell accurately points out that most of these traits did not originate with Black Americans, but white Europeans. This fact is important to point out, not for the purpose of blaming white people, but to debunk the narrative that the characteristics of Blackness, as it is understood today, are somehow innate in the wiring or DNA of Black people, and that since Blacks can't help themselves, the responsibility falls on society to restructure itself around Blacks. We don't allow Black children and Black youth to be kids. It's not helpful to walk up to black men and tap them on the shoulder and say, pull your pants up. Right. It's not. Exactly. <laughs> I used to be one of those young dudes that wore baggy pants all the time, and I would be so mad that folks would ever say that to me. Apart from the fact that all human beings, irrespective of ethnicity, are born into sin, cultural differences and deficiencies are a matter of nurture, not nature. There is something about 
black subculture in America today that holds African Americans themselves back? Yes, that very sub same subculture held white, whites back as well. And so it really was a question of the subculture, which was a handicap to both. When looking at the so-called gaps and disparities, many blacks have managed to take note of the fact that there is something going on culturally, not systemically, which is keeping many blacks behind and in the underclass. The majority of these people are not like we are. They've acknowledged that if blacks begin to willingly participate in Western culture, as opposed to resisting it, then those who are in impoverished and distressed circumstances will begin to rise out of such undesirable circumstances. All our young men are out on the corner, just absolutely doing nothing. That's the problem. Is there any way to stop the cycle of teenage pregnancies? I believe that teenage pregnancy cannot be stopped by programs. It has to be morals, and morals come from God. And somewhere along the line, the black family kind of strayed away from that. And I believe we need it. You say the moral values have changed. Oh, yes. There aren't any great white people running around in this block tearing up stuff. It's us. We've got to stop doing that. Once among these note takers was a young Ibram X. Kendi, known then as Henry Rogers, who at the age of 17 participated in an oratorical contest where he rightly lambasted the symptoms of mainstream black culture. I talked about black youth don't value education. I talked about black youth keep climbing the high tree of pregnancy, that, that black youth are not trained well by their parents. Now in his 40s, Kendi says that he regrets ever giving the speech, claiming that his criticism was due to his buying into, quote, anti-black racist ideas, unquote. In this speech, in which I thought I was being so progressive and, and so radical, in fact, I was expressing a litany of, of anti-black ideas. He has written many books on what is termed anti-racism, asserting that the onus is not on blacks to reject a demoralizing culture, but on the larger society to change the way in which it deals with such blacks. We spent our time trying to either incarcerate or civilize black people because we think something's wrong with them as opposed to this country. One of the ways Kendi attempts to indict the larger society is with the following argument, quote, if black people make up 13% of the U.S. population, then black people should make up somewhere close to 13% of Americans sitting in prisons. But today, the United States remains nowhere near racial equality. Black people make up 40% of the incarcerated population, end quote. This line of reasoning, which is a gross display of intellectual dishonesty, does not carry anywhere else. If I had 10 children, for example, and eight of them generally behaved well, while the other two, a set of twins, were constantly causing trouble, then the twins would obviously receive disproportionately more punishment and correction than the other eight. This wouldn't mean that the rules of my household are systemically anti-twin or unequal, but it will be a dereliction of duty on my part to not reproach or reprimand them when they harm one another, or to reward them in the face of what is objectively deemed bad behavior. In the same way that my hypothetical children are all different from one another, cultures are also different from one another, which is not in itself a bad thing. But if a few cultures happen to commit more violent crimes than others, as we see in large American inner cities, compared to the population at large, then the onus is on the individuals within those cultures to abandon it in pursuit of a different, more wholesome lifestyle. Dr. Thomas Sowell accurately points out that when a minority group begins to assimilate to the values and achievements of the larger society, they no longer depend on the bargaining efforts of their so-called leaders. Leaders of groups that are lagging almost invariably have counterproductive policies for them. And it makes perfect sense because insofar as members of lagging groups assimilate into the values and achievements of the larger society, they don't need those leaders. I mean, there's no, there's no mystery to me as to why Jesse Jackson says what he does, or Al Sharpton and others, because that benefits them, but it does not benefit the people they lead. Because to be black is to walk through the world and watch people doing things that you cannot do, that you can't join in and do. The reason we could never be who we wanted and dreamed to be in is you kept your knee on our neck. Whether knowingly or unknowingly, most leftist black leaders have used their influence 
to discourage Black people from adopting positive mindsets and accessing real opportunities and resources, which would genuinely make them more independent and successful. Ibram Kendi does this in his own way by disparaging capitalism as racist. You can't separate capitalism from racism. Mm -hmm. You can't truly be anti-racist if you're not being anti-capitalist. In a nutshell, a capitalist is basically an individual who believes that they should have full ownership of the money that they've earned for their work, as well as the property purchased by the money they've earned for their work. Every minority culture in the history of America who has participated in the concepts of capitalism have done incrementally well, including a large number of Blacks who are not generally thought of when the term Black culture is spoken of. Ironically, many of the Black leaders who spend their careers leveling indictments against the racist capitalist system have themselves benefited from that same system. They don't show up to speeches unless a dollar amount have been agreed upon. They reserve the lion's share of the revenue that is brought in by the books they sell. They don't sit on boards of organizations or take teaching jobs at colleges and universities unless a salary is to their liking. They consider themselves the crusaders of struggling, voiceless Blacks, but they don't live amongst those Blacks. They live in well-manicured, often majority white suburban neighborhoods or high-end luxury apartments. In short, Blackness is an identity that was manufactured strictly for political purposes and to utilize its adherents as foot soldiers for the undoing of Western civilization. The Achilles heel of this plot is the realization among Blacks that they are not as inherently pathetic or genetically marked with the stamp of inferiority as many activists, scholars, policymakers, and social ideologues insist. It's through realizing this and placing one's identity in Christ as a victor that one is less prone to being used as political ammunition against civilization and against their own individual growth.